Europe, uh, France and Britain specifically. Um, it is a very simple blessing and invitation to the elements of the four quarters to sit in circle with us as we undertake this next hour, 45 minutes or hour or so of our time. And specifically, it is a gratitude circle ceremony to give thanks to our Mother Earth on Earth Day. So while I drum, I will invite the four elements starting with the east and going round in a clockwise direction. And for each um, place, please hold in your heart a, a little moment of gratitude. And then finally, I will say, may there be peace throughout the whole world. And if you can, at that point, after the four, four quarters have been blessed, you also say that in your own way, may there be peace throughout the whole world. And then it will be um, open, open time for Trebi and David's conversation. So if you'd just like to take a couple of breaths and get comfy. I turn to the east and welcome the hawk of the dawn who represents the high vision of the high ones and the clarity of the new day. Hail and welcome. I turn to the south and greet the great stag with the fire of the midday sun burning between his antlers. He is the pulse of creativity in the brightest part of the day. Hail and welcome. Turn to the west, to the salmon swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, the water element, the depths of our emotions and our ancestors call us from the west. Spirits, hail and welcome. Turn to the north the darkness of the northern skies and the great bear who stands in his cave and he represents the rest time, the dark time, the incubation time. Spirit, hail and welcome. And I turn to the centre of the circle where all the elements meet in us, in the ceremony, in the great fire, in the center of the circle. And I ask for Mother Earth to feel my gratitude and hold the sacred space of everyone's gratitude to Mother Earth. May there be peace throughout the whole world. Now the ceremonial space is open. Mm. Can't hear you, Trebi. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. So if, um, if people have questions while we're having this uh, discussion, you can write them. What is a chat function, Harriet? Is that right? Yes, it's a chat function. You can write them into the chat function and Harriet will go through them later and we'll ask David the question. So um, as a brief introduction, I met David Paulus in 1987, and um, I met him through doing a multimedia show and video uh, with IBM. And they used to like to have us find uh, interesting and in, uh, inspiring people to do uh, presentations and, and for us to tell the story about them. 
and I was uh, very interested in um, Native American issues at the time. And I read about an article about David who had received a National Science Foundation grant to recycle steel waste. And so um, our client and the photographer and the audio technician and I went out to the Oneida lands in Wisconsin and I uh, interviewed David and he said something that really grabbed me and made me start thinking for a long, 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 long time. He talked about how he had realized when he went out to this enormous amount of steel waste in California, that the steel waste was not an enemy to be conquered. It was an orphan that had gotten separated from the circle of life. And his job was to bring it back into this circle of life. And, and those words really touched me. And for years and years and years, I sought for a way to, to do something with that. Um, it seemed to me like a recycling of, of the mind as well as of a, of, a, of a product that was considered waste. So ultimately that became Radical Joy for Hard Times. And um, it all started with David Paulus at the, uh, on the Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin. So David, I'm so happy to get to have you here today and to talk to you again. And, um, and I'm just curious to start out, is there anything that you um, have thought about since about this idea that waste is an orphan from the circle of life, both as you meant it that about the steel and also as, it, as it's come to be used with radical joy for hard times? Well, to go to the very beginning of, of what you started here today, I was, uh, I didn't understand till now that what we were starting with was an opening from a Druid uh, origin. And that, that, that is tremendous. That's great. I mean, we have people on all, they're the people over there, you know, the Europeans, they killed their ones that knew things like the stuff that we still practice here. Uh, but uh, I just have to add to it, all of our, ceremonies start with the thanksgiving and my one thought is we also use tobacco but we don't smoke it we just bring it out so i just want to add a thanksgiving for the fact that you are all here all the people that have come here and the you two women that have that are doing this this is your work now and i, I honor you in your uh work and uh, i thank you for being here with us along with all the nature ants bees trees earth dirt all of it thank you amen not a man, but a whole. Um, anyway, so your question was about the. Um, uh, again, say that question again well, briefly. You spoke to me those words that that so grabbed me all those many years ago. The waste is an orphan from the circle of life. So I wondered if you would just say more about that, both as it as it was relevant to you then, and also as how you might have been thinking about it in all these years since. Well, it comes to a, a story that I, I had heard. I think it was a Sioux guy. They always tell interesting stories. Uh, but anyway, he talked about the circle of life, that we're in the circle of life. In that circle is everything of creation, ants, bees. And when, when one is extinguished, when they become extinct, they go out of the circle. So you got to stretch your arms a little bit further each time uh, to keep the circle going. Well, with a lot of animals and things disappearing, the circle gets pretty tight. It's the same with these places in the earth. They have been in this. The one thing different about them, they have been in this circle. No, it's the same with the animals. They've been in the circles. And so have those sites that you're talking about. They've been part of our circle in the earth. And then when you take them out as a disgraced place or problems with environment, it makes that circle stretch. What you guys are doing is bringing them back into the circle. You're bringing the continuation, the growth, the ability that whatever's going to happen can happen. Many times the things that happen are for a reason, and this is part of the reason. So you guys would appear and come in here and start replenishing that circle. That's what I see. And you're doing it. And then from one little conversation with us, Trevi, what you have done and all the people and all these places in the world, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm truly amazed and I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I think we all do on this earth that we don't realize how it affects others, good and bad. And you have done something very good. You've done something very good. I just admire you. This is great. 
Well, and you know, you, you we talked um, a while ago about how that that grant that you had gotten to recycle steel waste and the steel industry collapsed, and you were feeling very badly about that. So, you want to say something about about what happened and what you've done as a result? Oh boy, uh, the steel mills collapsed. I'll tell you, they all went out of business in this country. They are gone. Primary steel is gone. I developed a process, worked in primary steel, take their hazardous waste, remove the waste that were contaminants, heavy metals out of it, and then put it back in the furnaces because it'd be a pure form of iron ore. And then they would recycle it and make new steel. Well, the steel mills went down and I had borrowed, uh, based on all of the stuff, I borrowed $4 million and I lost it all. I went bankrupt. I, uh, uh, I had nothing in the end. Uh, the, so the, the whole thing dealt with, that's what happened to me there, but I continued, I, I, um, recycled, uh, from the, from the plant and the issues that had occurred. Um, I went on, I worked within tribes and my own tribe. I, I had, um, uh, an appointment to the federal government as the first, uh, American Indian, um, in the position of uh, economic development director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Anyway, that position evaporated on me because Bush lost the election. And I went to work for Nupiat Eskimos as a vice president. And I've also then worked with my tribe. And uh, in, in the end, uh, the, the one thing that really stands out of all of that, that 10,000 ton it was not 10,000. It's over a million tons of these wastes at Kaiser Steel. I had started a process to recycle them, and it worked. And then they closed the steel mill. And I went back there about after everything was over. You know, I was in different business life. I started an insurance agency with Dick Butkus, which was very successful. We sold it for a lot of money, and, and things turned out well there. But the the idea of uh, I went back and visited the Kaiser Steel property that was there, and guess what? That mountain of waste was gone. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever I was assigned or whatever I was involved with, hey, it worked. It's gone. So the and waste was back. It was a member of the circle of life again. Yes. Wherever it yes. was. Yeah. And you know. Uh, uh, so it's kind of like you, you know, geez, you, all these years, we just had one story and look at what you developed. Well, I just walked on away and, and here I go back to see that pile and it's gone too. You know, it did whatever it has to do. Yeah. So maybe what that relates to is, could we be channels for all of this stuff? If we keep our minds, our hearts, some of our thoughts in a good way, even some of the bad ways we have. You know, my father taught me that what what you have in your life is what the creator has given you, the circumstances, the fate. And he said, you're not responsible for your fate. That's what the creator decided you should have. What you're responsible for is what you do with it. And so uh, I guess um, that's, that's where I come at it. Uh, the, the one talk with you, the, the attempt at the recycling, well, I, I guess I can try to look back and say, hey, it worked. Well, it's, so, it's kind of like also, you, like you drop a, pedal in a, a, a pebble in a pond, right? And <laughs> Very all, good. All, all each of us is aware of is the big splash. And what we're not aware of is all these ripples that go floating out, you know, long, long, long. And, um, and then it, just to, as an aside, when I was in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan in February, I met somebody, I overheard a conversation with him I said, do you know David Paulus? And it turns out that Chief Phil Lane and David used to be friends. And now he and I are working together to do projects of bringing healing to wounded places on native lands. So I just love how these ripples just go way, 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 way yes. out. And then they come back to where they started again. That surprised me so much that you met Phil Lane. Yes, there's many, many good things Phil has done for me, with me. Uh, quite a guy. And he's, he has not quit. <laughs> He's not quitting, no. So another thing that, um, well, I think we, we, these days we have to have in any conversation that anybody has, 
we, we have to eventually come and talk about the coronavirus and how it's affecting us because it's so it's so unprecedented and it's so alarming in so many ways and so many people are suffering um and i just wondered from like from your tradition and from really understanding about the opening and including all things um in what what is your thinking about the coronavirus well let me tell you an event that happened to me two days ago I was uh, waiting in line with mask on and gloves to go into a store to a grocery store. And there were people in a line and there was a woman ahead of me and she was smoking a cigarette. And you can smell that cigarette smoke, you know, when you're close to people smoking a cigarette. And it, it's just the, her turn to walk, go in the store. Well, she takes the cigarette and just throws it on the curb. And the guy who was ahead of me said, geez, I smell smoke somewhere. I said, yeah, that woman uh, that went ahead of you uh, was smoking a cigarette and she threw it on the curb over there. And the guy looked at it and he said, yeah, that's the cigarette. It was still smoking. It was, it was the, the smoke was coming up. And he looked at it and he turned to me and said, some people, you know, just what they do. And I said, yeah. And, and then I, I stood there for a while and he, he went in the store, it was getting close to be my turn. And, uh, you know, you gotta wait, some people come out, then you get to go in. Well, anyway, uh, I looked at that cigarette, it was still smoking. and I kept on staring at it, something attracted me. I said, wait a minute, that's tobacco. Within my tradition, in my tribe, tr tobacco, tobacco is sacred. It was brought to the earth by womankind when she came here. It's a sacred plant. And I said, now that cigarette over there, we felt bad toward that woman that way. I said, geez, should I go over there and just step on it so it doesn't smoke anymore? And I kept on looking at it and I thought, no. I walked over, picked up the cigarette butt. And I had a few steps to go to where there was a container to put the cigarette butt. And as I walked over to it, I recited the directions like, like Harriet did, the East, the Hope, the, the um, South. And for me, it's the women with love. And then from the North, the men with thought. And then the West is uh, where the uh, elders live. And then the Mother Earth in a clockwise circle, I would honor her that way and give a thanksgiving then and counterclockwise is the creator who gave us this fate i was talking about so i get that done nobody knows what i'm doing i you know it takes me a few seconds to do that i walk up to the container over there and i have the cigarette butt and it's smoking now tobacco for us is to be burned with prayers that's what we do with it uh, traditionally we don't smoke it we burn it with prayers all of our meetings are done that way so i had the tobacco and i thought you know what should i do now should i put it out or not and I thought, no, it burned, the prayer was done, put it out, and that was done. So that's what coronavirus just did for me. <laughs> Made me think. So it's, maybe it's one of those things of, you know, uh, we've got the faith, that's what was given to us. What are we going to do with it? Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, that's, that's, to me, that's really a radical joy for hard times story, too. You know, you see, you see something that's, that's sort of not very pleasant, somebody's smoking. Then not only do they smoke, they threw their cigarette on the ground. You could be annoyed. And instead you took all that and you turned it into prayers. That's, that's really wonderful. That's really transformative. Well, it, uh, uh, incidentally, that's copyrighted, so you can't use it. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought today what would be a, a story to tell you, the one with the circle and bringing back into the circle and, and and that's, that's what it's, it's done for me. There's a lot of contemplation I've been doing. I go in my whole, I have a place I do my stuff for meditation and I burn tobacco and I say prayers for people. And there's a lot of them, I'm, I, I said prayers for their own protection with what's going on now. Um, but, so this time, you know, it, it made, it's making me slow down a lot, it sure is. I'm going to retire this time, not start another business. <laughs> well, speaking I, of, okay, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think I know. Go ahead, please. Well, I was going to ask you about your, your basketball teams, you know. Yeah, this Can is you something. Tell us about okay. that. Okay, I started a nonprofit. And in this, um, I've been on board of directors for Goodwill International and for, uh, let's see, it's uh, for severely handicapped. They used to call it niche, now it's called Ability One and they get federal contracts for people that get jobs that have handicaps. And uh, I was on their boards and I got to see how the 
these are huge organizations, nonprofits, and the dollars that flow in there are tremendous. And the monies that are paid and everything. And, and I thought once, well, you know, I would like to have a nonprofit, but I think it should be a nonprofit. Nobody makes any money. And, um, and I don't have anybody against anybody wages or monies that flow in those groups. That's what it takes to make it go. But so anyway, I had a friend who uh, uh, had a, a basketball organization in Washington, D.C., where he trained 45,000 kids a year. I didn't believe it until I went and talked to him and saw some of his practices. I said, this would be great on an Indian reservation because Indian kids and the families, basketball's big. And so I, uh, he said, well, I'll help you set it up and you can be like a franchisee to me and you, know, you can have a business. And I said, I don't want a business. I just want to do basketball kids camps with Indian kids. And I said, by the way, how much do you charge people for these camps? He told me 150 to $300. I said, I don't know any Indian reservations where kids or their families have money for that. I want to do it, but I'm not going to charge anybody. He said, you'll never make it. I said, well, I'm going to try it anyway. So I set up a nonprofit and, and uh, I, I, I raised money for, did raise money for it. And uh, in six years, which ended this last year, we have seen 8,500 kids, 103 camps, uh, 30, 34 tribes in seven different states. Wow. And so I think my work is done. That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I think I'm going to go to Costa Rica, Mexico. <laughs> Sunshine. Of course, I could go in my backyard 50 yards away right now today and get some sunshine. It's about 70 degrees today. Yeah, that's in, a great uh, story, Mexico. your basketball mm -hmm. story. So, you know, you mentioned your Hogan a little while earlier. And, um, and for those who don't know, a Hogan is, well, in my experience of it, it's a Diné or Navajo um, building. And it has uh, eight sides, which are all created very ceremonially when it's built. And, um, and I know you did one global earth exchange there in your Hogan, and you've done a couple of others, um, I think with Monroe, Sikafus. Yes. Um, can you tell us about what doing the global earth exchange was like for you and what happened? Well, I, I went in there to my Hogan and, and uh, the, uh, Hogan is not for my people. I use a Hogan here because it's, I'm not in my own territory. I'm in the Navajo and Pueblo territory. So that's why I have a Hogan structure. And I was advised by a very good uh, friend of mine who was the lead medicine man for the Muscaleros till he died two, three years ago, Paul Ortega. But uh, he said, you know, I was gonna build a longhouse, which is our tradition. He said, no, you gotta do something honoring the people here. It's their territory. So that's why it's a Hogan. But anyway, I went in there and I started to do this ceremony and I saw, I remembered how you guys made birds. And I made birds out of eagle feathers. And there was a crow, crow wing and a wing from the, uh, uh, the goose, the, the wild geese that fly through here, the snow geese. And so, and that's the picture that I sent to you. And, and I, I, I thought in terms of what has happened on my reservation, we had a terribly polluting uh, hazardous waste site from paper mill waste. The tribe, we built our brand new hotel there, our casino there. We uh, really still, we, we developed it. We tried to stop the dumping of that material. We never did, but we've got all the environmental things where it's all closed now and they have, you know, earth piled on it and everything. So it's returning to the earth. But I just see how my people so worried and concerned about the earth worked with this process. And we built a heck of a structure, which we give our kids 20,000 a year to go to school. It can be college, beauty school, whatever. And uh, that's after high school. So did I, did I answer it right? <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, what, but, but so, I, mean, I just wondered what it was like for you to participate in a global earth exchange. No, I mean, in a way, knowing that all of this, the, the whole idea of Radical Joy for Hard Times had taken this long road from what you said when we were meeting on the Oneida Reservation. Yeah, well, participating in, in the exchange really just brought to light to me that there are other peoples that think this way. And even, even among our own people, we have ceremonies at certain times, but, um, and we always have, we're, we have to, we're, we honor the earth. And we were told 
there would be times like this that would be coming that erupt. But so going to an event like that and seeing other people that had those types of thoughts and the way they honored the places they were in, the words that they shared, the, the, the alone time that they wanted to, you know, to, to meditate themselves. It, it was very moving. It was a ceremony. That this is one thing among indigenous people, as you just saw in the beginning of this whole event, there's a ceremony. You know, maybe some of the other world or some of the other processes where they read those books, uh, I don't want to put it in an ignorant matter like that. But where is the ceremony? Because everything, I mean, everything has a meaning. Mm -hmm. And ceremony can help you understand some of it. Yeah, and what, what we have found with Radical Joy for Hard Times, which is so gratifying, is that, that everybody loves a place on earth. Yeah. And that, that, that love of your place transcends your race, your religion, your gender, your background. And, um, and so the, the beauty of being able to do these very simple gifts and ceremonies for, for the earth with Radical Joy for Hard Times, it just enables... It, it enables that love to be expressed in, in people of all kinds. And as you say that, I think of the times there's many people doing other things and oh boy, it's time to think about the earth. You know, the only time to think about the earth is any time, just like that cigarette butt story. Any time, anything, any little thing. It, you think it's little. It just shows respect. It just is in our ways, consider that Thanksgiving. Thank you, Creator, for all that's here, the trees. You know, everything has original instructions by our teachings. That includes the trees. They're told to go straight up on height and go in the ground with roots, and mankind, and womankind, especially in our tribe. We're matriarchal, boy, those gals are tough, but they have, they're given original instructions too, as you have been given. So I wanted to ask you one other thing, and this might be something that you, you said to me once when we were talking, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, that, that you probably have forgotten, but I didn't forget. We were talking about radical joy for hard times and this idea of, of taking care of places that were hurt. And you said that these places that are hurt are like uh, soldiers. You may not agree with the war, you said, but you have to honor the soldiers. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. You want to say something more about that? What you mean about how we can honor these soldiers? Which well, are places? Those soldiers are just like those sites that you go to. Those sites were part of our circle. They, they were taken out. But in, when they went out to fight, the soldiers and those sites, they produced things that were to give us benefit. That's why that was being sacrificed for us. The ability to bring them back in it's it's sacred it's it's great and like you said believe in the war or not they're the ones that did what they had to do and they followed their fate and what they did with it they honored it and they went forward with it and did it right or wrong it's another story on that one so um, finally, I mean, I just, when, when, when I first called you up, um, remember, and I, I had read about you in that magazine, and I said, you know, could we do a, could, could we come out and, and do a story about you? And you said, no, you know, you didn't want to have all that attention be on yourself. And, um, and then, so I was going to, I just was thanking you, and I was going to hang up the phone. And then you remembered you'd had this dream. You remember? And oh, yes. So I wanted to know if you, if you would, tell that dream and then i wanted to ask you if you've had any other dreams lately that have been significant because in several different conversations i've had with you over the years you've had some pretty amazing dreams well that dream related to um seeing lo looking for for what was going to happen i was running a business for the tribe and there was a lot of pressure and stress and then I had this dream where I got this phone call and it was someone who came to see me and I asked, well, who are you? And they said, well, I'm, they, they said they're from IBM. And uh, I said, well, well, what do you want? And they, they said, well, we want to talk to you. 
and and uh, and it was a very powerful dream. Uh, and I just kind of you know slept the rest of the night and got up the next day. I remembered the dream distinctly, and uh, uh, within four days you called and you asked, "Can we do this?" And I thought, "Oh, I've got so much work to do. I didn't want anything else to do." And then we were about done with the conversation. I'm not sure where you got my name or, or how that ever came about. But anyway, we, we got toward the end of that conversation and then we we're ready to hang up. And I said, wait a minute, you came to me three or four days ago and you told me you would be calling me because you mentioned it was IBM. And I said, so whatever you tell me to do <laughs> is what I have to do. I have no choice. So I said, if you want me there, I'm there. If you don't, I'm not offended. Because you had to make choices, I think, as I remember it. And um, we hung up, and then you called back and said, we're going to do it with you. But, you know, I was just thinking about what happened when you came to the reservation. You came and you had music that was like a powwow music. And uh, that you said, oh, we could use this in, in the video. And, and I said, well, you know, we have our own music with water drums that we use. And we have singers, and we have certain ways that we we sing our songs. And I said, I was going to call someone to come if they would agree to come and show you what we had, what we do. And they did come. And it turned out that our faith keeper and our traditional chief came. And they, they, uh, they sang the songs, which you recorded with the water drum and with your permission to use. You know, they gave you permission to use them. There was also the point, as I remember, that Bob Brown did the opening. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I will tell you this. I've been with those guys before that for a number of years. And after that, I've never seen them do that for someone. They knew that something special was in this. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done that. Oh. They, were, they were led or guided to do it. And, you know, can I go back and ask them that? When you're in that mind frame, you just do what you're supposed to do and you let it go. Um, and um, anyway, uh, that was special. They they gave they would want you to take this power and go forward. I know, and you've done it. That's it's uh, that's why I'm so I I I feel very much as a what a wonderful deal God brought someone that really did something for our people. Wow, all of them. Yeah, well, that includes, that includes the ones on the English side, too. Well, now, <laughs> since she talked in a presentation that I didn't know if they had the sun come up from the east or the west over there, I thought it might be different. So, <laughs> so I'm glad she. And they all honor, we all honor the, the four directions in the earth and the sky. Isn't that something? It is. You know, to me, indigenous spirituality deals with the experience of God. There's many others that, that deal with a direct personal experience of God. I think that's a potential out of oh. indigenous spirituality. And that's, maybe that's why we're still around, to remind some people that, hey, this is still around. And some people say, well, I don't really know how to do it. I want to watch someone else do it. Well, they know how to do it, too. And they, many do do it uh, in their own ways and in, within our ways, too. This is, that is great. Yeah, you're right. Direct spirituality. Yeah. Direct absolutely. spirituality versus religiosity, which I call, I don't know. That's like making a judgment. I don't have to make a judgment on anyone else. This is just the way it is for us. We have feathers, we have smoke, we have tobacco, uh, different tribes. Well, we, we all have our ways, but we have the, what we are seeking is an understanding and an experience with God. And I do believe it does occur. I have not had current dreams. I'm having more more events, like the cigarette one, mm. I'm noticing. Every year since 2004, crows have come in the numbers of about 100 plus to my house. And that started in 2004. And when 2004 hit, I said, I know that the, um, the crow, what are they here for? I, t I told my wife, I said, I don't know. Something's going to happen. I said, it could mean my death. I don't know. But they showed up for about a month and a half, and then they went away. They were here every year since 2004 till this year. Hmm. They didn't come. Hmm. 
at the very end of uh, the period they would be here, about two dozen showed up for about four days. And I would put corn out for them and they came and took it very, and I said, something is up. And you know, I never took my Christmas tree lights down. They're still up and I turn them on every night. <laughs> In my yard, I have a big tree, Christmas tree. <laughs> So it's, it's uh, I don't know if you call it actualizing or what, but I guess I'm, I'm seeing more things right now. And uh, not, a, not, I don't, I haven't, I've had dreams, oh boy. I've had dreams, but not, uh, not uh, maybe one, the ones that are more prophetic or that are. So when was the last time you saw the crows? How long ago? That would be just, well, just be the, Beginning of March. Well, I bet you'll find out what it was all about. I think it's this. See, our prophecy told us that we had a peacemaker, that uh, the peacemaker was our prophet and the Iroquois nations. And we had, uh, he gave us a prophecy. And he said, there's a time coming when there's not going to be foods and there's going to be problems. And he said, uh, the, the story, the, the warning is you must grow foods every year, grow food. And I haven't been doing that. So right now I have a pet tomato plant. I'm growing a tomato plant this year. So that's my, my task. Good. <laughs> well, I hope it does well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Harriet, I wonder if we have questions from people. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, Good. Yes. Um, so I'll start at the start. Um, Ellen Stein Weaver, Blessings for Earth Day. May there be peace throughout the whole world. Jess Kovach. Thank you, Harriet, for the grounding opening. So heartfelt and connected. Polly uh, Howells. Where did the waste go? Do you know, David? And I think she's referring oh. to, the, to the mound of the earth. Well, no, I don't know where it went. I, uh, I have no idea. I did not... You know, to me, it went back into the earth. Mm. And that was the task I was about. So I was done. Mm. So I, you know, I, I would, I, I'm not sure if they, I just don't know. These were iron oxide wastes. Been accumulated, the, you know, that steel mill had started in World War II. <laughs> and that's the place where they piled them all. I mean, there's a, I don't know. I, I, uh, I didn't attempt to research it further. They're gone. Sasha, that's so interesting. Uh, the comment, your comment about ceremony helping you understand the meaning of things. Could you share more on how ceremony helps in that way? I think from a mystical point of view to make a comment on that, that takes you to a place maybe that you came from, or maybe that you're going to, or maybe that you're in. And it's a nice place, and it's a pleasant place, and to, to bring that feeling and thought into your mind brings that energy with it. In, in a mystical framework, with that energy, there are uh, entity, they're spirits. The, the, but within that idea of their spirits, you know, the spirits in the trees, their spirits in the dirt, their spirits here in my sagebrushes, um, their spirits in the uh, pole I keep outside to guard my house so the crooks can't even see the house. So that's what ceremony does. You may, it makes you think, well, what do you mean you're talking about making a house invisible? People can't see it. I don't know, but haven't had any crooks come around here, so it must work. Um, so ceremony takes you into a place where maybe you came from, and that's more mystical. Maybe logically, there's they're trying to define more clearly some of these places that take you above and beyond your issues of that. Well, your issues of health, your issues of uh, depression and and grief. Uh, they take you to a place too, and that can sometimes be good or bad, unpleasant. But the ceremony it has its intent in there, 
We do ceremonies when people die. We do ceremonies for the foods. You know, if we don't do ceremony for the foods, they came to us at one time we didn't do them, the ceremonies for them. And the foods told us, if you don't do ceremonies for us, we're not going to stay. We're going to leave. So we made an agreement with them that we, they were going to already leave. They said, we're leaving. And we said, wait, we want you guys to stay. What will it take? And they said, well, I don't know. You make a deal. Make us an offer. And we, our people came back and said, okay, if you leave, you're going to not only hurt us, you're going to hurt the faceless ones. The faceless ones are the unborn ones, the ones in the stomachs of the women already. They're good, the ones going to suffer. Maybe we deserve it because we didn't honor you. But so we, we want you to stay and what we will do, we will honor you in every ceremony from now on forever. And the food said, okay, but if you miss one time, we're leaving. So we have, that's why we have a ceremony for our food. We want to eat. So I hope I'm hitting it with someone. In your mind, there are places you probably, maybe you know, maybe you don't, or maybe you, you walk by them, but you didn't stop and look at them or go in that room and say, wow, what's, what's in here? Why is it so pretty? Why does it feel so nice? That's what a ceremony is for. It's to take you to a place where your ancestors are. And maybe you don't believe you have ancestors. That's okay, too. Well, the ones that you don't know, then, the invisible ones are there. And these are the ones that you're communicating with. So I, I guess I still drifted back into the mystical side rather than the logical side. Uh, mystical just says it's an event and no one has to believe it. it it's, it's not, it, that's not a requirement. It's what did you feel? That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Jess? Um, again, uh, Trebi, I like the image of the stone making ripples in the water. Do either of you have experiences where small actions have made bigger changes, bigger, much bigger than you could have imagined? So you already sort of highlighted your, your own experience. I wonder if you can um, expand that a little bit for Jess. Well, I would just give us the example the woman who dropped her cigarette, you know? <laughs> she just dropped her cigarette because she was going into the store and it ended up being a prayer, you know? It's like, I don't think we necessarily know the, the outcome of our ripples. You know, that's, that's the, really the magic of it. We, we just, we do, we do our action and then the ripples take over and they have their own kinds of consequences. So a tossed out cigarette book, uh, but becomes a prayer. My experience has been dealing with uh, Indian kids in basketball camps. You know, a nonprofit, we don't charge the kids, all of that stuff, and I gave you the numbers. But the real neat thing is to see these little kids. They could have never afforded to go to a camp. They don't have that kind of money. And they go to the camp, and, and they, they, we're training basketball. We're not, it's not how, how you compete and you're the tough guy. No, it's just experiencing what basketball is like. It's an athletic experience, which in my life has made the whole difference. I, I, well, anyway, uh, that is really gratifying to me to see some of these little kids. And I just remember one little kid on the first camp we did in Navajo country. He was bouncing the ball, and he's, he's, he was like five or six years old. And they didn't have the hoops come down. They're way up there. So he's, he keeps on throwing it up there, keeps on throwing it up there. I keep on watching this kid. A little chubby kid reminded me of me when I was a kid. And being a chubby kid anyway. And he kept on throwing, he never stopped. Finally, he threw it once and it went through the hoop. He stops, he looks at the basketball, and then he looks up at the hoop, and he looks at the basketball, <laughs> and he starts throwing it again. <laughs> so that kid's gonna grow up to be like me. <laughs> I loved it, I loved it. And, and uh, particularly like the Navajos, the women, the girls are some of the best basketball players. They're very athletic, very competitive. And, um, but what we were teaching is just what is the experience of the sport? We weren't after NBA players. Just have some fun, learn what it's about. Uh, a lot of Indian kids don't get on teams because they don't have any particular discipline in, the, in what is the basketball uh, is about. And what, that's the kind of thing we did. It was very gratifying. And we got a lot of positive comments from kids and parents. And some nice, happy stories. A couple of years later, kids on basketball teams they'd never been on before. So were you teaching them about like, how to get along with one another and how to be a team as well as, as, well as the rudiments of the sport? Or? 
Absolutely. My coaches, all of them are Indian from different reservations. And, uh, you know, they've been there. And so when they're talking to kids on, on the reservation and they talk about respecting your parents and, and they had more of a traditional leaning, uh, they were traditional people too, I guess. Yeah, they just believed in their, their old ways. I mean, their, uh, the traditional ways. And that's what they were teaching the kids. Some of them were teachers. A lot of them were coaches out of the high schools on the reservation where they, they lived through some tough stuff. A couple times uh, they were asked about some stories about their background, and there were some things they shared with the kids, you know, where there were problems with alcohol in the family, um, and how this girl ended up going to college. It was a, very much of a star and got her education, and she teaches high school here locally, and she's Navajo. Great athlete, good girl, good woman. So, so even if they didn't go on to play basketball, they still, you know, it, it, it was a big step for them in a, in a direction they might not ordinarily have gone in. One day a woman came in and she was the mother of one of the children in this group. They were ages, this is about fourth or fifth grade. And she said, I, I, she said, are you associated with the basketball? I said, yes. She said, well, I come here because something happened at my home. I always tell my daughter, you got to do this chore or that chore at the end of the day. And she just sit there and lollygag around and look around and really not do it or do it well. She said, all of a sudden, she, she would come home and I'd say, well, okay, you got to do this chore. And then she'd stop, look me directly in the eyes, and then go and do the chore. And the woman said, I can't forget what the heck happened to this kid. What did you do? She said, because the only thing different is you have this basketball stuff. Hmm. And she said, you know, I've been sitting here 20 minutes watching what your coaches does. He blows that whistle, and then all the kids come to attention. They come up into the line and they do the drill. <laughs> she said, that's what the difference is. She listened to the coach. And she listened to the whistle, and she knew the next step was to stand in front of that coach and find out what is the next thing to do. Mm -hmm. That was gratifying. <laughs> thank you. Um, just feedback from Sasha again. Thank you. That feels so good to talk about ceremony helping with meaning. And also she asks, we're hearing that the Navajo Nation are particularly having problems during this time of COVID-19. Would you have anything, David, that you'd like to share about how we can help? Well, well, you remember the stories about the U.S. Army coming in with blankets with infected with uh, smallpox and giving them to tribes on Indian reservations, particularly on the East Coast. So I guess we've been involved in pandemics. And I think one of the reasons we exist is because there's immunities now that have built up in Indians where they didn't have them before. Uh, the Navajos, they have uh, not a, they've got a quarter of a million people on that reservation. They have, uh, I, geez, what's that? I think they're on 800 cases now. They've had about 30 or 40 deaths. I'm right next to Navajo. In fact, part of Navajo is in the state of New Mexico. Um, there are, there's one group, Noted Begay Foundation, out of uh, New Mexico, and they've given me a grant. And they're uh, from Nota Begay, who was an Indian golfer, from, he's Navajo in Pueblo, and he's raising funds to put food and a lot of water. They, they, it's, they don't have a lot of, a lot of places they don't have running water out there. They just don't. Water's not a high commodity, but, and there's, there's a number of people out there that live the older traditional ways, a lot by choice, which is great, living in Hogan's. But if you got, that group I know is raising funds and they've pledged 100% of whatever dollars they bring in. It's not going to overhead, it's gonna go directly to the NAMS. So Begay would be B-E-G-A-Y, and what, how do you spell the first name? Nota, N-O-T-A-H. N O T A H and then B E G A Y. So yeah, it's, it's called the Nota Begay Foundation. Nota Begay the Third Foundation. So that's a good one to if somebody wanted to donate for yeah, helping. That, right. That that's that's that, that the hard cash is that money that comes in there, all of it's going back into something for the next. Right. And they have Indian youth programs. That's where I'm very associated. With. Mine is basketball for we're the, the main supplier of doing basketball. On reservations so that is one and they uh you know they have more communal living too 
the elders living with younger ones, and you may have the generations in the households. And then not having a lot of water, you're washing your hands and things like that. Mm, right, yeah. And uh, uh, another thing, you know, there's many Indians, uh, myself included, that are mixed Indian and other races and ethnic groups. Uh, the Navajo are, there's a lot of full-blooded Navajos out there. So less of the, this, what they call it, herd immunity might apply there to diseases. And the issue of diabetes, heart disease, it's there. They have less of a healthcare standard. My tribe, we're excellent on healthcare. We're excellent. We spend $30 million annually on a group of, uh, on the reservation, there's about 5,500. Uh, totally, we have 16,000, but the rest are scattered throughout the country, like myself. But we have we have first-class healthcare. We've had it. That's where profits from our uh, gaming have gone to. That's good. Are there any other questions, Harriet? Uh, no, that that's it. Um, for the live feed. So thank you so much to everybody who has asked a question or made a comment. That's really great. Um, and I don't Do you really, have anything you'd like to add. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. I, I I really have been listening and been thinking, but I don't have any questions. Just more more no things I've noticed and um, yeah, the the tobacco. Um, the tobacco um, cigarette story really uh, resonates with me because I can feel you bringing that cigarette back in this, to the circle of life. Uh, you, you know, mm. it's the, the most wonderful, simple act, you know, that tobacco is, is such a prolific and seemingly terrible thing for people, which it, of course it is, and it can do so much harm, but yet there's a purity within it of, of the, the divine plant spirit that you, you recognized and you honored, um, and that is bringing it back into the circle of life. It's just the most beautiful example of that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, and it's it really is a beautiful story about how it's possible to, I mean, it's so similar to your, to your steel waste story. You know, something that's just, how do you bring waste in back into the circle of life? How do you bring something that's, that's reviled that everybody wants to ignore you know, like the guy in front of you in the supermarket line. How do you make? How do you turn it into a prayer? It's a wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful task or mission for all of us. That must be why the Creator gave me the choice to make a decision on that. Yeah, I think so. So that uh, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel very good that uh, whatever we're saying here, it's being heard. And, uh, you know, I, I'll just bet you 10, well, I'll bet you a lot of money that just from this conversation, there's going to be some events now that are going to pop up for people with choices they're going to have, very similar. And, uh, it's, and what do you do? What do you, how do you make the choice? Well, I guess if you got a little time, like you're waiting in line with a pair of rubber gloves and a, and a face mask, you got a little time to think about that. So maybe the creator's making some of this stuff slow down. I, you know, it's, it's terrible to say maybe, but what we've got is what the creator has decided. Again, like my father said, and I said in the beginning, it's not what we've got. It's what we do with it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're responsible for. And uh, slowing down, less pollution in the air, I hear, because all the cars aren't going somewhere. There's some things happening here which could cause some very drastic or very, could be very simple changes, probably, and many of them very necessary changes. We still, you know, the, it was, it's not, never been a story of if mankind's, if the, that the earth is going to disintegrate, you know, with the environment and everything. I've always said it's the, the humans that, it, the, here's the issue, it's whether humans are going to be around here. The earth is going to be here. She's been here a long time, and she'll be here a longer time yet. Whether we're going to be here is really the question. Mm -hmm. I think this might make some people think, well, maybe, maybe, maybe there is something to this that might not be here. So I should take this action. We'll see. David, thank you so much. Um, 
you know, I'm such a long journey from 1987 and now Radical Joy for Hard Times is this global organization and it all came from those, those few words of yours that just landed in me. So it's such a treat to get to talk to you again and, and to hear what you're, you're doing and what you're thinking and how you, you, you're just continuing to like take the events of life and, and figure out how to make them more beautiful and more sacred and, and more connecting. So thank you so much for being with us. Remember, I've given you some words of encouragement now. That means you must continue what you're doing. And you take the words of encouragement, let them come into your heart, and it's going to glow and feel good inside of you. But then go back to your work, because you have more to do. Definitely. Keep on working, Debbie. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for listening. And um, our, next, um, our next Earth Exchange Cafe is in May. And um, we have a wonderful elder named Ann Stein who's going to be speaking then. And um, I can't remember the date, but we'll, we'll let you all know. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.